you guys doing? If we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Greg Hintz, lead pastor here at the place, and I just want to thank you so much for being here today. I know you could be anywhere in the whole wide world, and yet you choose to be here, and that means so much to me. And we got a, a lot going on, and, and there's two things before I dive into my message that I wanted to cover. First off, you know, in, in, in view of the recent tragedy that has happened in the last couple days, I thought it was good for us as a church to stand in prayer for the many people who have been affected. And so if you guys would bow your heads with me, we're going to pray. God, Lord, we don't understand all things. And any time that we watch the news or we hear about these tragedies or travesties that take place, we as the church, we, we stand in the gap for those that are hurting now. We stand in the gap for those that their whole lives have been altered because of one person's decision. And Father, we pray right now for them. We ask you to be strength in their lives when they feel weak. We pray, Father, that you're comforter in their hearts and comforter in their lives. And Lord God, even though we don't understand and things don't make sense, that we trust you and we trust, Father, that you know all things. And so we ask you to be with the many people that were affected. And we ask, Father, for you to move in their lives, move in these communities today. We pray that in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about this morning was the shift or change that's happening here at the Place Church in the next couple months. Now, you guys may not know this, but we're missing quite a few people at the Place Church. I don't understand it. They think it's too hot. All right, so they leave every summer. We like to call them our winter guest. Some get offended by the word snowbird. And uh, so they are our winter guest, and they are on their way back. Now, we understand that in the next month or so, everything is going to be shifting and changing. Now, you may not know this, but at this church, 40% of our congregation leaves. We've, that, we've done the equation. It's 40%. Now, that's a lot. Now, proactively, you know, we saw at the end of last season, it was getting super cramped. We were near capacity. And we weren't enough chairs, anything. So we're going to make a shift in just a little bit. But before I get to that, I want you to open up your bulletin and pull out your connection card. So I'm going to ask you a question that I'm going to want you to respond on your connection card. So get that connection card in your hand. Starting in the month of November, the Place Church is going to be going to three services. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's right. Now, we are adding a third service. Now, let me tell you the times of our services starting in November. There's going to be a 730 service. There's going to be a 9 o'clock service. And there's going to be an 11 o'clock service. The 730 service is going to be slightly different than the 9 and 11. Now, the 730 is going to be a slightly abbreviated service. Probably the total time would be around 45 minutes. The music will be uh, maybe of a generation before. Ah, so if you miss some of them oldies but goodies, this would be a great service for you because that's what we're going to be focused on. Now, we're not shipping in an organ, so don't get too excited. All right, but uh, the, the music will remind you of your youth for some of you. The songs that you remember coming to church, that's what that 730 service is going to be. Now, there's not going to be any child care at the 730 service, okay? But that's just a little picture of what it looks like. Then the 9 and 11 will be much like the 830 and 1030 services that we currently have right now. Running time would be about the same message. Everything music would be about what you have right now. Now, here's what I want you to do on your connection card. I want you to write on your connection card the service time that you are most likely to attend. Now, you, you're going to be able to come to any of them, but most likely to attend the majority of the time. Is it 7.30? Is it 9? Or is it 11? I want you to write that down, and then just one per family is fine, but then I want you to write the number of how many people you plan on coming with and circle it. If you have kids, our children's ministry would love to know how many kids to begin to plan for in November, so you can write that down too. At the end of service, we're going to take our offering, and I'm going to ask you to take that connection card and put it right in our offering basket. And we're going to be looking at those numbers this week. Now, this past week, we sent out uh, through SurveyMonkey a survey and an email and a text, and we have found that about a third of the respondents were interested in that first service. So we saw like quite a few people that are like, yeah, that's a good service. You know, it's the people that may be wanting to go out roping on Sundays. 
right? They could get out. They could be on the arena by 8.30, lassoing up things, you know? I mean, this would be a great opportunity. Or maybe if you're not much of a cowboy or a cowgirl, maybe you just want to start the back nine by 10.30. All right, maybe you're more of the golfing type. This may be a good service for you to think about going to. You know, it's, it's going to have all the elements of the service that are later, but it's just going to be a little bit different. So you guys write that down. Yes. All right. Good. Write that down. I cannot wait to see that. I cannot wait to see your responses. Now, don't come at 730 next week. This doesn't start until November, and it will only run for six months. November, December, January, February, March, April, and then in May, we're going to be going back to our two services. So it'll only be running for six months. It'll be six months with three services and six months for two if everything goes well. All right? Now, enough of that. Let's dive in because we're going to finish off the message that we started last week, the message called Ask, Seek, Knock. And what I want to talk about today is going to be the last part of those verses. And today I want to talk specifically about the subject of character. And when I started thinking about the subject of character, I actually went back in time for a memory that I had. And some of you guys remember this. I used to read this comic strip, and the comic strip was uh, called Peanuts. Did you guys ever just see that? Charlie Brown, Lucy, Pig Pen, you know. That. I'd always read these comic strips. And I was reminded of this one scene that I would see over and over again in this comic strip called Peanuts. Now, Lucy would normally come out looking for Charlie Brown, and she had something in her hand. She normally had a football, right? And she'd look for Charlie, and she'd look at Charlie and say, Here we go, Charlie Brown. I'll hold the ball, and you come running up and kick it. Some of y'all remember this. And Charlie would get excited. He's like, man, this is my moment. I'm just going to launch it over the mountains over there. And he'd back up and he'd prepare and, and he would take off running as, and, and he would go to kick that ball. And then in the next scene, we would see, ugh, Charlie Brown, Lucy would pull up the ball. Charlie Brown would kick it and fall back on his back. And she did it over and over and over, and he fell for it every time. You know, I tell you that story because maybe that's how some of us feel about God. See, Lucy lacked character. In Charlie's eyes, Lucy surely was going to hold the ball there the whole time, was going to allow him to kick it over the mountains, going to allow him to have that moment. But every time, Lucy let Charlie down. Some of us, when we talk about prayer, maybe for us, we feel that God may be kind of like Lucy, kind of just ready to pull that ball away if we put too much trust or too much hope, or maybe we've been let down in the past and that has affected how we see God and that has affected how we communicate with God. It's all those truths, but we have to understand and we have to know the character of who this God is that we're calling out to in prayer. Thanks for that. Good catch. You should play for the Chiefs. <laughs> He's a big Chiefs fan. Now, last week, we opened up our conversation in the book of Matthew chapter 7. And if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and open it up. If you don't have one, there's one in the seat back in front of you. Just grab that, open that up. Matthew chapter 7, we dove in last week and we looked pretty deep in just two verses. Verse 7 and verse 8 in the book of Matthew. And, and here's what we read. It says this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. And what we began to unpack last week is we began to unpack that we're there for prayer. And we talked about this asking, seeking, and knocking oftentimes isn't for ourselves, but we're called to ask and seek and knock for other people inside of our life. And so when we come into contact with people and they have a need or they need a miracle or they need God to do something great, we, we let them know, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to begin to knock. God, you know this guy. You know this girl. You know what they're going through. And God... 
I need you to move on their behalf. And we're called sometimes to become this, this bridge in between. This week, what I want to do is I want to look at the next two verses. So you guys already got that open. Same chapter, same book, except now I want us to look at verses 9 and 10. The same thought is there. It's coming on the heels of this ask, seek, not conversation. And then we hear these words. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Now, I, I got to pause there because when I first read that, I'm thinking to myself, what on earth are you talking about, Jesus? You know, this idea of if my son asks for bread... Why on earth would I give him a stone? And sometimes when we read the Bible, we read it through a 2019 United States perspective. And when I read that, I'm thinking of the Wonder Bread loaf. You know, that sliced white goodness, you know, you go through and it's, that's why, that doesn't even look like a stone. Like if you have a stone looking like a loaf of bread, that's, that's, that's weird. But then if I understand the culture and what they're like, their bread was much different than our bread. In fact, even the way that they cook the bread was quite different. And they still cook this way today in many areas of the Middle East. They, they build this thing. Well, let me show it to you. It's called a tanner or tanner. And it literally looks like a hornet's nest. If you've ever seen a hornet's nest made out of mud and sometimes dung. And uh, there it is uh, made and, and it would solid, it would become solid and they would put coals and they would start this fire on the inside of it. They would then make the dough for the bread and they would take, and they would take that dough, put it in these little cake-like things and they'd stick it to the inside of this little hornet oven and the bread would begin to cook. And you knew the bread was done and it was cooked all the way through when it fell off the side of the oven into the coals. And then you'd pick it up and you'd say, yum, this is great. But see, like when we understand that, we can see how bread and stone, that could go hand in hand. But then I think the real message that Jesus is getting across is what kind of twisted dad would do that? All right, Johnny, let me give you this piece of bread. <laughs> it's a stone. <laughs> you know, like, what kind of weirdo would do that? But then it gets even stranger for Jesus because then he says the next thing. Or if he asked him for a fish, would give him a serpent or would bring him a snake. Don't worry, it's not real. Uh, you know, they, your child wants nourishment and then you would give them a snake. Who would do that? And especially if you're Jewish, because if you're Jewish, you can eat a fish, but you're not allowed, according to Jewish dietary law, to eat a snake. So who would do that? What kind of father would do that? If your kid asked for nourishment or if your kid asked for fish, why on earth would you give him a snake? And what Jesus is doing here is what we talked about last week. Do you remember that technique? It was the technique that says, even if, how much more? And Jesus actually alludes to it in the next verse, in the same chapter, in verse 11. He says, if you then, who are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. Look at this. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I mean, he's literally saying if, if your Father who is evil, who is a fallen person, would give good gifts, isn't going to deceive, is, is going to try to do their best to give nourishment and strength to their child, how much more? Would your Father in heaven take care of you? See, Jesus is, is really challenging us and our understanding of who God is. And our understanding of who God is absolutely marks everything inside of our life. Our understanding, truly, of the character of God forms our relationship with God. And for me, that was a hard thing growing up. 
Growing up, I was the kid who had to go to church every single week, had to, and I had to do it because it was the rule. It's what you had to do, and so I would have to go there, and I would have to show up, and it became kind of a struggle for me. When I was a really young kid, I developed this idea about God. When I pictured God, the picture that I had of God is that God was very grumpy, very angry. And God was consistently looking for me to mess up, and I never let him down. All right? I, I messed up, and I messed up a lot. And the picture in my mind was actually God sitting behind a desk with this big ruler. And he was just waiting for me to make a mistake. And when I did, he he'd hit me with the ruler, right? He hit, hit me in the back of my head. Bam! Like, straighten up, boy. And, and this thought of God or this belief of how God is. And some of you, that may be the place where you are today. I mean, you may picture God or see God, or maybe you remember growing up and having these thoughts in your mind. In my mind, what happened was I had a desire to know God, but I was kind of fearful of him. And my problem is I could never do enough good to make God happy. And so anytime I did something I wasn't supposed to do or did not do something I was supposed to do, immediately this shame and this guilt would come over me. And I would feel that shame and guilt, and then I would make the decision. I would say, God, I'm going to get better. God, I'm going to do better. God, tomorrow I'm not going to do that thing. Or tomorrow I'm going to start doing that thing. And the next day would come. But the problem is the next day I would do the same thing over again that I wasn't wanting to do. Or I would not do that thing. And then immediately that shame and guilt came. Now this continued on for some time. And remember, I had a desire to know God. But the shame and guilt drove me to this place where I ended up as far away from God as I possibly could. Because if I was far enough from God and I didn't really care about God anymore, then that shame and guilt couldn't come over me. And some of you recognize that because that's where you are today. You may be in that place and you're just starting to take baby steps back. But the problem is, is that shame and guilt often comes back. And to keep ourselves safe... We separate ourselves as far as we can, and that worked well for me for many years, this separation. But what happened was someone challenged me, and they gave me this thing called a Bible. And what happened was I began to read it. Man, that mamba is holding on to my Bible. <laughs> Sit down, mamba. All right. And I began to read it, and as I began to read it, here's what I found out. My thoughts about God weren't true. God wasn't waiting for me to make mistakes so that he can punish me. God, God was actually on my side. God actually had love and care and compassion and grace and he had all these things. And I began to read through these words and read about the love of Jesus, how Jesus out of his great love would lay his life down for me. And I remember just reading them with tears in my eyes, so moved that God would do such a thing for a person like me. And what happened was the character of God came into true perspective. Not my perspective of a youth or a child, but I truly began to understand who God was and how who God was affected who I was. See, we have to have this understanding of who God is to you. Like, who is God to me? And if who is God to me is not true with who God is in Scripture, well, then I need to realign my belief or my thoughts to line them up with God. And so what I want to do today, I just want to unpack four things you may not have known about God, of who God is, what the Bible says about the character of who God is. And the first one is simple, is that God is gracious. What that means is that God is filled with grace. I didn't understand that word grace. I thought it was just a prayer you said before you ate. And, uh, but I began to learn a little bit more about it. And then I heard a story that gave me the full picture of what grace meant to me and, and maybe what grace meant to you. It was a story about a couple pastors. 
They lived in the 19th century in London. Now, one of these guys you may have heard of before, his name is Charles Spurgeon. Well, Charles Spurgeon was a pastor in the 19th century in London. And there was another guy who was another pretty well-known pastor, even though you may not have heard of him. And his name was Joseph Parker. He had another really big church inside of London. Well, one day, Joseph Parker was talking about Spurgeon's work. And Spurgeon did a lot of work with orphans. And so he had an orphanage. They were trying to rescue kids off the street. And what Parker said was he said, when the kids get to the orphanage, they're in pretty rough shape. They're, they're, they're in pretty bad shape when they get there. Now, what happened, though, this hit the rumor mill. And you know how when something hits the rumor mill, it begins transforming and changing. And when this statement hit Spurgeon's ears, the statement was this. Charles Spurgeon's orphanage is poor. It's it's, it's junky, it's messed up, it's no good. Even though that's not what Parker was saying, that's what Spurgeon heard. So Spurgeon immediately gets angry. He gets upset. And so he writes a letter to the editor of the newspaper about Joseph Parker, tearing him down, publishes it in the paper for everyone to see. In addition to that, the next Sunday, he gets up in his pulpit and he begins to rip this guy, a new one. You guys hear about Joe? And he begins to just unpack just how messed up this guy, Joseph Parker, is another pastor in his town. Well, Joseph Parker finds out about it, and he's like, man, the next Sunday he gets up in his congregation. Spurgeon was out of town, so he wasn't at his congregation. Parker looks at his congregation. He says, this week, Spurgeon is out of town. This is the week that they would normally take an offering for their children's home. Why don't we, as a faith community, take an offering for Charles Spurgeon and the work that he's doing with orphans? They passed the offering baskets. They had to actually refill them three times. They filled up three times that day. Can you imagine Spurgeon that week when a delivery was made from Joseph Parker to Charles Spurgeon for money for his orphanage? And, and here's what I want you to see. Spurgeon that next week went to Parker's house. He knocks on the door and the words that he said to Parker have been recorded. I think they're so profound even for you and I today. He said, you know, Parker, you have practiced grace on me. You have given not what I deserved. You have given me what I needed. And I can think of no greater definition of grace than that. God not giving us what we deserve, but God giving us what we need. We don't deserve his love, his grace, his forgiveness, but he chooses to freely pour that out on our lives. Why? We would ask ourselves, why would God do that? Well, it's the second key, that God is love. I mean, God is filled with love. I didn't know that growing up, but I know that now. And I know that because as I'm reading the Bible, I come across this verse in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that says this, God is is love. It doesn't get any clearer than that, does it? That's, that's who God is. God is the epitome of love. So he's gracious. He's filled with grace and he's filled with love. It is who he is, not just to me, but to you, to you in your life, right where you are right now, that he loves you not because of how great you are, not because of all the awesome things you've done for him. He loves you just for who you are. That's how great his love is for each of us. And he loves us, and I love this next one, that God loves us even though God is omniscient. That means God knows everything. He knows every. He knows the things that you've never told anyone. He knows the things that you keep locked up in the back of your heart, those things that no one else knows. He knows those things. And even though he knows those things, he's still there. 
He's still with you. I, I love this verse that I read in scripture in the book of 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Listen to this, because this is, this is your story. It says this, when our hearts make us feel guilty. Have you been there? Uh, probably. When our hearts make us feel guilty, when that feeling of guilt comes over us, when we know that we've done wrong, when we know that we've messed up, when we know that we've missed the mark, when our hearts feel guilty. Listen to this next part, though. It says, when our hearts make us feel guilty, we can still have peace before God. Even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes, even when, we say, even when that, we can still have peace with God. Why? Because God is greater than our hearts. Can I get an Amen. God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. He already knows everything. He's, he's omniscient. You don't have to run from God because of what you've done. You don't have to run from God because of the temptations you face. You don't have to run from God because of the mistakes you've made. No, you run to him knowing that he knows exactly what you've done. He knows exactly where you've been, where you haven't gone. He knows everything. And my Bible tells me that he loves you in spite of you. Even though he knows that he still sent his one and only son, Jesus. Because my Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the last one's really important, especially if you're trying to figure things out in your life. You're, you know, maybe you're in a place of confusion or you're not really sure what your next step should look like. The next one is for you, that God is wise, that God is all-knowing. I don't know if you've ever been like me, but sometimes I would have a decision. I would have to figure out what was next, and I would begin to read every book on the subject. I would begin to talk to every person I would know. I would pick up the phone. I would call Oprah. I'd be like, come on, Oprah. Come on. What do I do? May I watch her on TV? What's my next step? What should I do? And let me tell you, there's all kinds of people wanting to tell you all kinds of different things. But God's there with the answer that we need. Oftentimes in my life, though, he's the last one I turn to. I go everywhere else. I ask everybody, I read everything, I do Google searches and all kinds of stuff until I can't find the answer. And then finally I'm like, God, what do you think? God's like, it's about time. I've been waiting. And, and give me the answer that I need. I love what it says in Proverbs 2, 6. It says, only the Lord gives wisdom. He gives knowledge and he gives understanding. Listen, learn a lesson from my life. Don't wait. Don't go to God last. Don't ask, seek, and knock as a last resort. Begin to go there first. When you come to the crossroads and you have to make a decision before you talk to everybody else, pause and say, God, what do you want me to do? What's the next right step? Give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. Give me peace in my heart as I move forward. If I'm not supposed to go, don't give me peace, God. Show me where you want me to go. Show me the next step that you want me to take. See, when we begin to understand who God is and his character, it changes our posture for prayer. We begin to now want this time with God. When we begin to understand that he's filled with grace, he's not looking at me through a judgmental eye, but in through the eyes of forgiveness. When we begin to see that God is a loving God, that he's not looking to judge me or hurt me, but he loves me like a father loves a child. That's his love for me. When I begin to realize that he already knows everything and he loves me in spite of me, and he, I don't, there's no secrets in my relationship with God. He's the one person who knows it all. And the last thing is that he has the knowledge, the wisdom that I need. And, and when we understand that, God begins to glow in our hearts and glow in our mind. And it was that word and that, that concept that I, I want to end with today. It actually drove me to a portion of scripture called 1 Peter chapter 2. And it's a description of Jesus. And here's what it said. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And I started thinking about that. In fact, you guys, when you walked in, you got one of these things. Go ahead and put that glow stick in your hand. Hopefully everyone got a, got a glow stick. 
I saw someone in the back, they cut it off, and they thought it was something else. So, sorry about that. <laughs> Let's begin to, to break that glow stick as I begin to describe for you Jesus through First Peter and what it said. I mean, literally, his body was broken for us, much, much like this glow stick, broken for us in our lives. And I, I love how Jesus described himself. And we see the words in John chapter 8, verse 12. It says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What I want to end with in this series, when we talk about asking and seeking and knocking, I want you to know that Jesus is the light of the world. Through his brokenness, through his freely laying his life down on a cross, now he offers light to all of us. And when we, through our brokenness, through our humility, come to him, when we say, God, I, I don't know it all, I need you. I need your forgiveness, I need your grace, I need your love. When we come to God, here's what God allows to happen. God allows us to take that light. Remember we talked about it last series, where he looks at us and says, come on guys, you are the light to the world. And, and, and we take that light and that light begins to lead us, guide us. It illuminates things, it shows us things, and it allows us to bring his light in the midst of other people's darkness. You see, it's not our light. It's not because we're so smart or so good or so wise. What we're doing is we're taking God's light and we're allowing that light to shine into the lives of other people. This week, as, as you see this, or maybe even later today with this glow stick on your dining room table, your kitchen counter, I want you to think about this. Am I asking? Am I seeking? Am I knocking? Because God has you on this earth to ask, to seek, and to knock, not only for yourself, but oftentimes for others. We are called to be light in the midst of others' darkness. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Will you bow your heads with me? God, I thank you so much. Thank you so much, Father, for your word that is alive, living, and active. I thank you that we're able to look at our lives and see the importance of asking and see the importance of seeking and see the importance of knocking. I ask you right now, Father, to encourage us on our path, on the path that you're calling us to walk down, to do what you've called us to do, to be salt and to be light in the lives of others. And maybe you're sitting here and you're hearing these words and you're thinking about your life and you're thinking about, that's what I want. That's what I need. I need that light in my life. I'm sitting here. I'm, I'm lost. I'm going this way and going that way. But I desperately, I want God to be present in my life. I want him to lead my next steps. I want him to show me the way. And if you're here and maybe there's just stirring in your heart right now, I, I want to say a prayer with you. It's a simple prayer of surrender. It's a simple prayer of brokenness saying, God, it's not about me, but it's all about you. And if you would like to surrender your heart to Jesus today, I want to pray with you. And here's what we're going to do. If that's you, on the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand up high so I can see it. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right where you're at. So you'd say, yes, I'm ready to follow Jesus. On the count of three, lift up your hand. Ready? One, two, three. Lift up high so I can see it. All right, all right, all right. I see you, I see you. Is there anyone else that would say yes to Jesus? All right, we're going to pray a prayer. It's a simple prayer. If you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer out loud. If you're here and... You're a follower of Jesus. Pray this prayer with those that are praying it today. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my past, for my sins, for my mistakes. But today, I run to you. Jesus, I believe that you lived, that you died, that you rose again, and that you have a plan for me. Help me see me through your eyes. Now, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone who prayed that prayer today. Lord, be with them, strengthen them, and help them, Lord. See themselves through your eyes of love and grace, through your eyes of omniscience and wisdom. Lord, I just pray that they glow for you and for your glory today. I pray that in Jesus' name. The boy says, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I got a special gift for you as you walk out. It's a, it's a little book called New Beginnings. Pick that up. It's our gift for you. Take it and begin to work through it. This is now the time of our service where we're going to take our tithes and offerings. If you need an envelope, there's one in the seat back in front of you. 
You know, uh, we always say here, when you give, lives are changed. And the interesting thing for us is that we see that not only here in Wickenburg, but all over the globe, lives are being changed because of your giving. But I know that there's others, maybe some that are struggling. Maybe you're in a place right now where you're trying to get to the other side and figure things out. And I really want to challenge you where you're at because I've been there. I've been at that place. And the temptation sometimes in our life is to hold everything really tight. Is to be, I, I got to guard this. I got to keep this safe. I, I, can't, I can't let this go anywhere. I got, and, and we get that way. And we wonder, God, why aren't you blessing? God, why aren't you opening the door? God, why aren't you? Because this right here, this posture, this place where we find ourselves, you know, no one's going to take anything out of that hand. But guess what? You're also unable to receive. Sometimes God is stepping in our lives and he's challenging us to live generously, to be generous people, not to live like this, but to live like this. And the amazing part is when we begin to do that, when we begin to say, you know what, I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to be generous and I'm going to be a giver and that's something that I'm going to do and I believe in the vision here and I'm going to give to the. When we begin to live like this, not only can money go out, but now money can come in. See, sometimes we're, we're living like this and we're saying, Why, where's the blessing? Where? And God is unable to give into a closed hand. No matter how much he wants to, he can't do it. But the minute that you step out and say, I'm going to begin to live in generosity, not only are you able to give, but you're able to receive. It's a true spiritual principle. So I want to challenge you. If you've been like this for a while, maybe it's time. Just, just start, start living generously. Watch what happens. Mark my words. You'll come back in a month and be like, man, great. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what took place. If you just go from here to here, but you're the only one that can make that decision. Let me pray for the offering that we're about to take. God, thanks so much for the ability to give today. We just pray that you bless the offering. I pray that you bless each and every single person that's giving today, Lord. Those who have been faithful, those that have been given, I pray that you continue to open up the heavens in their life and pour abundance into their life. Those that are going from this place, maybe even starting today to say, you know what? I want to begin to be generous. I want to begin to live generously. I pray that you just move in an awesome way in their lives and just show them that generosity is the way to live. I pray that in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.